I was just going to take off and I was just going to head basically straight north. I was going to have the Appalachian Mountains to my right. I was going to find that lift. I was going to kind of just ride along, cruise in, just make final glide land and get that trophy. Welcome to Soaring the Sky, a glider pilot's podcast. My name is Chuck, and I'm your host, coming to you from the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States and flying with the Cumberland Soaring Group. This is episode 80. Thank you for joining us. We have another great episode packed full of great soaring content with some more great guests. Before we get started, I do want to thank you for listening and continuing to support the podcast. If you haven't already, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you really like what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple Podcast or on your favorite podcast app. Our latest review comes from Devron in Great Britain. Thank you for your five stars. Great to have you here and part of the podcast soaring community. It is greatly appreciated. Also, if you want to support us financially or maybe just say hi, buy us a coffee or a cold beverage, you can do that as well. Well, by going to patreon.com slash soaring the sky or by going to our website and hitting the support the show button. A big thank you to those of you that have done that and financially continue to support the show. We do greatly appreciate it. While you're on the website, you can also sign up for our upcoming newsletter. This episode is sponsored by the Southern California Soaring Academy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in the high desert of Los Angeles County. Soaring Academy is dedicated to growing the sport of soaring with young people through its 8th grade STEM outreach programs and giving back to PTSD-afflicted veterans during private monthly events. Flight lessons and mountain soaring are available year-round to the general public, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. To learn how you can get involved, check them out on Instagram and Facebook at Soaring Academy or online at SoCalSoaringAcademy.org. On this episode of the podcast, we first talk with Pete Appleby. Pete is a soaring pilot with the Merlin Soaring Association Club in Virginia. He has been flying gliders since 2012 and discovered sailplanes through building and flying RC model planes. He has participated in wave and cross-country soaring camps, as well as finishing fifth in the sports class for his first regional contest in Perry, South Carolina in 2018. Pete currently flies a 1980 DG200 and just finished his gold badge in May of this year. Today he shares his aviation journey and talks about the importance of not only glider maintenance, but trailer maintenance, and shares with us a scary incident he was involved in while transporting his glider on a busy highway. Later, we will hear from another soaring tale from Dale Masters, author and glider pilot, and this one is called Too Late to Rush, Too Soon to Quit. For our tips and techniques segment today, we'll be joined by Miguel Intermende from the Perlin Project, talking about soaring and stratospheric wave. We will then wrap up the show with our soaring safety segment as Ben Mays talks about aerobatic training and how it can make us better and safer pilots. All this and more now on this episode of Soaring the Sky. Pete Appleby, welcome to Soaring the Sky. So glad to have you today. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Where are you flying out of? Currently flying uh, out of Merlin uh, in Richmond, Virginia, right, right outside of Richmond, Virginia. Okay, very nice. So you probably know our friend Chris. Yeah, I actually enjoyed his podcast and uh, certainly enjoy his company at the airport because we both fly the same glider and have been flying together uh, actually quite a lot. Uh, it's been great having him. So how did your aviation adventure get started? So I think the latter half, l- l- end of the summer of 2012, I started seriously considering it coming out, uh, being pretty active flying RC models, gliders, helicopters, and all that stuff. But somehow I discovered it and decided, okay, it's time for me to check this out. So I drove from Richmond West to Waynesboro, which is about an hour and a half, right into the first ridge of mountains, Skyline Drive, probably a lot of people are familiar with that in Virginia. And uh, nonetheless, I walked in, took my first flight in their beautiful ASK-21, which at the time I would think was pretty new, and proceeded to get really airsick. You know, after, of course, after being on the ground, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm so, you know, being so excited. So talking with all the instructors, got up, got in the, the glider, and then, yeah, I came down and puked. Oh, so, no. that, yeah, that always takes the wind out of your sails a little bit. But um, yeah, I think as the day goes, they couldn't give me another flight. They were pretty busy at the time. So I drove home, sort of tail between the legs, like, man, uh, I really want to do this. But that was tough. Um, f- feeling like maybe that was going to continue. 
but sure enough, showed up, I think a weekend later, did two flights, had no issue and uh, was totally hooked. Oh, nice. Yeah. So from there, uh, it was tough to get training. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the club environment, it's great, but sometimes you can only get one or two flights a weekend or depending on your schedule, maybe even a, a flight day. So it's hard to move through to get, you know, solo and then to finally get uh, your ticket. And I was bumping into that. So at the same time, I was always just looking on the internet, always interested in soaring, looking at Virginia soaring sites, all that, um, and ran across Merlin Aerodrome, which is right out, you know, probably a 40 minute drive, 30 minute drive. And then that's where my training really took off. Eric Lambert was there. I started training in a 233 and then went down to uh, Florida and actually got my ticket down there on like a, I did like a three day commercial flight after flight after flight one weekend and then came down like two months later and passed the check ride and that was it. So I think that was like, oh, great. that was great. So I, I just tried to get through it, but ha having the ability to do a commercial training is great if you want to get through it because it's really repetitive. They do a great job. Well, we've talked about it on the podcast, you know, belonging to a club and like you said, not getting enough flights maybe in a row, whatever it may be, go to a commercial outfit and you're able to get it done and like you said, two, three days and then come back and finish mm -hmm. up. Yeah. And there's also the benefit. I mean, you know, I think it's great to get started in the club environment, get your feet wet, get some flights in, of course, take your time with it, learn to run the ground, learn the operations of an airport. Uh, but kind of once you're getting going, you're getting your patterns pretty good. And now you're kind of chomping at the bit to just get more time in the seat. It's worth it. And then some to, you know, sign up. I think there's a William Soren Center out on the West Coast is really good. Um, mm -hmm. Anyhow, it, it was worth it to me. I'm glad I did it because I was able to kind of get past getting my license, which sort of opens the door for you to get to the club, get in a glider and go soar for two hours. Or maybe, you know, get your own glider and really start developing your flying. How was the commercial outfit? So you showed up and it was just like a lot of flying or how did that work out? Well, Seminole Lake at the time and Seminole Lake has been a, an interesting story. Um, when I went down there, I forget the name of my first instructor was there because I had two set different instructors, but the first one was great. I'm coming from a club environment where the best day I had uh, was four flights in a day. And I'm assuming, you know, maybe I don't know what, what really to expect. And out the guy rolls and we're in the little clubhouse and we do a little bit of ground training, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, just talking about stuff, I guess, for him to kind of get a feel of where I was on that aspect of it. And then we went out, pulled out one of the, their Blanics. Um, and essentially you rent an instructor and the Blanick for a day for five hours, four hours, whatever you want. But I was serious. I was like, let's just go the full day and get as many flights as I can get. And out came the Pawnee. They put me in the front of the glider. Of course, we went through all the checks, probably another hour of ground on just the Blanick itself. And then we started flying and it was like nonstop. I mean, we took off 2000 foot tow maneuvers, pattern land. I didn't get out of the glider. They'd spin you around, hook you up, go again, nonstop. I mean, we did that until lunch, took an hour lunch and then went again until almost sunset. It felt like oh, nice. so fantastic. Yeah. I mean, a little bit expensive, but that you're, you know, that kind of repetition, especially with your pattern work, it's just, it's good on the brain. I think it's, it's worth it. And Seminole Lake, uh, I don't, I am uh, still doing that to this day. So I have not been down there. I know they're under new management, but I imagine it's still just as good, if not better. So I always encourage the people at my club to consider it if they can, or at least do a weekend, not necessarily just to get your ticket, but just to go fly a different site, fly with a different instructor, and also consider, yeah, getting, you know, 10 flights in in a day. And what's that going to do if you're flying, if you're working on some aspect of it? You know, it's probably a really good thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd taken a couple of flights in the K-21. And then, of course, like most American pilots, right, the 233 was my workhorse trainer, which I was very used to. Went down that first weekend and got in the Blanick. And by the end of the weekend down there, soloed. So now I was solo. Went back home, kind of got to do check out flights of uh, Eric, my primary instructor back in Richmond, and then got in the 126. 126, then I was tearing that up for about two months, just trying to fly that as much as I could. Was studying and then went back down again. And I think I'd already probably obviously passed my written at that point. And then another two days training with a new instructor down at Seminole Lake. And on that Sunday with that uh, Nickenbacher is his last name, Sean Nickenbacher was my, uh, did my check ride and the oral, all that stuff. So it was great. And that Sunday came home and felt amazing. Nice. Yeah. That, that had to be amazing. Um, anyway, from there I got back to Merlin and continued working in that 126, but already had an eye on wanting to buy a glider. So that was a, a big focus. 
I was looking constantly trying to decide what I wanted, but from my RC flying days, I'd always been in love with the DG gliders. So I immediately started looking for a DG 100 and actually I couldn't find one. At the time Wings and Wheels was really getting steam. People were starting to really put gliders up there and nothing was coming up for sale, man. And I was, I was like, that's the glider I want. I'm 6'4", I need a big cockpit. Wanted to have a glass ship, so finally settled on a Grobe. I'm going to get 102, the single seater. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And flew. I found it uh, up in New York, drove up there, and like a lot of gliders of that era, because I think it was a 1976, and it was imported from Denmark. Beautiful glass, you know, European club maintained, so that was fantastic. Reasonably low hours, but the trailer was kind of a home-built catastrophe, right? And I know everyone says, you know, buy the nicest trailer you can with, and whatever glider comes with it, but... I was of the opposite thinking at the time, of course, young, young and dumb. Uh, I said, you know, this glider is beautiful. It was big and spacious. Anyone who's been in one knows, bought it and trailered it back home. So that was my first glider. And I began to really build hours in glass. And of course, it's just a standard class ship. But man, what a difference that makes to step up from, a, you know, 126 into even the first generation glass ships. I highly recommend it to any soaring pilot if you can. Big difference. For sure. What are you flying? I'm flying the uh, 126, so I haven't made it to the glass ships yet. I believe me, I, I like a lot of American pilots, cut everyone. You know, kind of all your early solo hours, first 50 hours are in, was in a 126, and it, it teaches you so much. But one thing I think is tough about it is it's sort of, I'm sure people have seen the saying about uh, it's a low performance ship for a high performance pilot. It's certainly forgiving from a standpoint of maybe takeoff, tow, landing, all those good things, very good, easy nature. But to go cross country or even to stay up because, you know, it just doesn't have the legs. Um, there's so much more cushion with a glass ship in a lot of ways to get between thermals. So in some ways, it's, it's a great training ship again because you got to be good to, to keep it up, um, especially cross country. Yeah, the, the 126 is about the same performance as the 233. It's just a little smaller, shorter wings. Right. So fun to fly, though. Oh, yeah, it's a blast to fly. The, the ridge soaring in that thing is amazing. Right, oh, yeah, not, and that's something I've not yet done. Oh, you got to do that, yeah. So what did you step up in after the, you said the you, you purchased the Grove? So I purchased the Grove, and I brought it back and planned to fly it for a while. I'm still somewhat disappointed that uh, I had not found a DG-100, which is kind of the, the ship I really wanted. Nonetheless, was flying it and enjoying it, and uh, I got my eyes set on this uh, trophy called the Boomerang. At the time, it was up in Front Royal, Virginia, where it often is. Um, it kind of gets traded between uh, mountain soaring clubs. But I was a member of w the Waynesboro, the uh, Shenandoah Valley Soaring Association, SVS. Um, so I decided I was going to take my new Grove ship that now I had, you know, I couldn't tell you how many hours, but some XC hours. I had been doing some uh, smaller XC tasks. So I was comfortable doing that. I'd been flying Condor, um, and I'd planned out this route to fly from Waynesboro all the way up to Front Royal, which I think is only, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. I want to say it's 60 miles. Okay, so, and on the way up, you have Luray Caverns, you have a couple of real nice concrete airports. So I figured kind of airport hopping with those decision points that on a good day, I was just going to take off and I was just going to head basically straight north. I was going to have the Appalachian Mountains to my right. I was going to find that lift. I was going to kind of just ride along, cruise in, just make final glide land and get that trophy. And of course, bring it back, not to Merlin, but to SVS. So anyway, that was a big game plan. I had this all the flight planned out. I got called my mom to... Uh, to crew for me and we're driving up there and I decided, you know, she better learn how to drive with a trailer. She's a good driver, safe driver, but, uh, she, she had never really trailered anything before. So I had trailer the thing all the way back from, uh, upstate New York and it, you know, it wasn't a handful at all by any means, but you know, every once in a while a big truck drive, you, I noticed it had a, it would get a little sway going, uh, but didn't think anything of it. So, I had my mom drive around Charlottesville in the town there, uh, where I actually went to school and she did just fine. So, you know, 15 minutes later, we pull on the highway, let's give it a shot. So we're just cruising along the highway. Um, we're probably 40 minutes outside of, uh, Waynesboro. The day's popping, clouds are coming up. It's looking awesome. And, uh, I look over and all of a sudden she's getting the shakes on the wheel and we're fish tailing. We're going 60 on 64 West. And all of a sudden we're jackknifed. I mean, it just happened like that. And she just starts overcorrecting oh, and I wasn't, you know, I kind of tried to grab the wheel, mm -hmm. but what are you going to do at that point? And all of a sudden we're sideways on the highway and thank God that trailer actually detached from the tongue of my car, my truck and released from the truck. So it didn't flip us or put us further out of control. And it started barrel rolling down the highway and into the median ditch. And thankfully all the traffic sort of just slowed down behind us. So they all kind of witnessed this happen. But sure enough, I mean, I, I'll still remember it, uh, 
watching that beautiful glass ship because oh, wow. I think the rear popped off and you could see it tumbling inside of the trailer, which was fiberglass and collapsing. Um, and that was it. So sat there for the rest of the day as we got a, this big record to come and grab it. And then they put it, uh, put it somewhere in Charlottesville in a, in a dump. And that was basically oh. the last I saw of it. So that was it that took, took out the glider completely. Now, I mean, I looked in there and uh canopy was destroyed, but I mean, God, those things are strong. It was really just puncture wounds and a couple leading edge, oh, man. Dam uh, little leading edge damage. But I mean, overall it's something with, they could it looked repairable. What do I know? But I mean, it's amazing what those things can take. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, what a shame. I really felt bad about it just because they're all little works of art, you know, I mean, they're never going to be made again. Um, it's just a vintage, vintage automobile essentially. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't never know what happened to that glider, but, uh, that was it. And, uh, I got the insurance money and, um, you know, it's certainly uh, worth mentioning that if you have a, if you have an older glider, older trailer, and you haven't done much trailering, because a lot of times you end up buying it from a club member, right? It just stay, it stays there as the, the mini hanger. Yeah. Right. Everybody hears about, you know, make sure you pack the bearings, make sure you put new tires on the tires, absolutely dry rot, especially for a longer drive. Even if they look good, they dry rot easy. It's unbelievable. I mean, I've had tires blow where it doesn't, it's barely, it has no mile. I mean, the treads thick. It's just from the, I guess the UV damage. Um, so that is worthwhile doing. Also, of course, is the, the tongue weight and that whole system pay attention. Sometimes, you know, the ball size matters, um, 50 millimeter versus the, I'm thinking two and seven eighths or something like that. But having all that checked out because yeah, you can lose your glider that way. It's a shame. You always hear about glider maintenance, but you don't really hear about trailer maintenance and you're carrying around that glider. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, you know? Um, but it, in the end of the day, I think it was probably just a combination of things, uh, a little more tongue weight. And, uh, my mom maybe having a little more experience and uh, probably would have made it there, but oh, well, you know, lesson learned. And, and actually I think if you, it was the photo, there was a photo, Costello insurance put a photo in the uh, story magazine, which is the glider. Oh, really? Sort of warning other people, don't do this. Oh, wow. Don't be dumb like this guy. <laughs> well, you learn from it and other people. Yeah, hopefully so. Hopefully so. Be safe. You know, you got yeah, the, the flight almost begins when you, leave, you know, hook it up to the to the car to be equally diligent. I kind of I got the insurance money and I was very intent still to keep flying. And I, I was like, well, if this is a sign. I've got to find this glider. So I wrote letters to every owner I could find in the FAA registry who owned a DG100. Essentially saying, hey, I'm a new pilot. I really want to get into cross-country soaring. I'm looking for the performance. If you aren't flying the ship or be interested in selling, you know, please contact me. Out, out when I think it was nine, maybe nine letters, I found nine people who had one. Um, and I received two responses. One was no thank you. The other was yes, um, but which was cool, right? Uh, but it was sort of, hey, this is the, you know, I'm going to top of the dollar. And I, I actually was pretty much like, I'm going to go buy this thing. Uh, it was a beautiful ship. But right when I was sort of thinking to do this, another guy called me out of Erie, Pennsylvania. And he had bought in a glider, a DG100 from Texas, that had been, I guess, sitting in a trailer that had gotten, I guess, either some water damage or just left for years. And the entire glider was like uh, the uh, desert dry bed. It was that cracked. Like when I say crazed, I don't know. It had a matte finish that uh, one of my club members, when I brought the thing home, uh, said, he was like, is that a wood wing? <laughs> oh, no. uh, you know, it was that bad. But so anyway, I drive nine hours in Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm like, here's the glider. I've gone just to honestly, maybe three or four weeks with uh, without really flying anything. Um, so I'm just chomping at the bit and the season's approaching and out they roll this thing. And I'm being, oh my God, it was ugly. But uh, otherwise, a beautiful ship, a DG one and one G, I think, um, which is, has all the you know the uh, hmm. auto hookup uh, elevator, um, obviously the parallelogram stick, one piece canopy. Uh, it had a little extra room in it. I mean, it just and it, especially again coming out of the primarily one twenty six, this thing felt luxurious, uh, as worn out as it was. Oh yeah. I'm sure. um, so bought it on the spot. Had a nice Comet trailer. I learned my lesson. I was like, hey, that trailer is beautiful. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, you know, immediately realized, oh, wow, this is a nice, heavy tongue. This is how it should be. Got on the road and I mean, it, yeah. it trailered like a dream. And I thought, wow, you know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. So got it back home. And that was really, I felt like kind of the next chapter for my soaring because I had this ship that I felt and I just felt great in it. I, I remember I got it home with this huge thunderstorm rolled through 
and Eric Lambert, my primary instructor and the guy who started Merlin, uh, got in the 150 and uh, towed me up. And I got it like over, you know, there's some clouds breaking up. I got a beautiful sun dog uh, over a cloud. It was just a beautiful flight. It was so smooth and quiet. So, yeah, I just felt like, oh, man, OK, new chapter in soaring. Here we go. And that's kind of where I started really working on becoming a cross-country pilot with that DG 101. So you went on, flew some more, obviously, and you did some racing, right? We were talking a little bit before we started recording the podcast here. Yeah, and I think I want to say that it was around 2014 or 15 that I got into the DG. Um, so I wanted to, of course, just know that ship inside and out and started really working on just doing circuits around the airport, of course, and then going to the local airports, trying to set tasks and getting comfortable with that. Meanwhile, Eric, who is our, again, the primary instructor and also an active uh, soaring pilot, would go down to Perry, South Carolina, for a few seasons prior and race. And he had nothing but good things to say about it and always invited me to go. Uh, and I was really interested to do it, but wanted to have the experience, wanted to feel like I had my silver badge, those things. So I was kind of working on that stuff. And then 2018, it just felt right. I felt like I had enough experience to at least do it. Still very new, of course, but enough experience to do it, especially with Eric kind of mentoring me on the way down. So we put the gliders in the box and drove down there. And I think that was in, what is that? That's a, that, a contest in March, like the first week in March. And man, again, another world. The, uh, the uh, Concordia was there. Um, a lot of America's really top-notch sailplane pilots, big 18-meter uh, class there, very competitive in the 18-meter class. But I was in the sports class. I want to say uh, maybe another 12 or 15 pilots. Everyone's so nice and friendly. And um, yeah, we got to race out of a week, three days, plus one practice day. Otherwise, it was too windy. Yeah, it was just too bad. There was uh, some good days, and it was really impressive to see the 18-meter class full of water taken off with these, you know, gusting 20, 25-knot winds. And, you know, it's flat, and they're out there doing a huge task in these incredible winds um, with still maintaining high speeds. So that was really cool to see. And then, of course, they do a debrief uh, typically the next morning when you're getting the task assignment. And every morning we'd do it. We'd grid, get ready like we were going to go. And then they'd call the day for wind, which I think was always the right decision. But it was great to go through the motions, but also kind of talk soaring in the morning, hear from the yesterday's winning pilot. If you've never been to a competition. Um, so it's, it's almost in a way, although it's a competition, my first experience being at, at one was more of a, a training camp where everyone's kind of willing to talk to you about the task, give you pointers about the day's task. You know, you grit up in the morning and everyone's out with their gliders kind of doing their pre-flight, all that stuff, but also talking to each other about plans, about weather. So there's a lot to be learned there. So I just tried to kind of soak it in and fly conservative. I think the first actual competition day, we still had reasonable wins, but it was blue. And they called a mat task, a modified area task, which I think I'm saying that right. Essentially, and I'm sure you know, you've you've read about this and people know about this, but if you don't, gives you the option of, you know, maybe doing a 50 mile task or doing a 120 mile task if you want to fly deeper into these turns. So it gives you some flexibility there, but also some strategizing where, depending on you know if the weather's variable, you can maximize your speed by flying deeper into one zone with good weather, good clouds, and maybe just nicking the turn point where it's not as good. So it's cool, again, to learn all the strategy and talk to these people or all, all the other pilots about it, because I think you know, these math tasks are pretty big in the U.S. So I really just, I was like, I'm going to make it home. That was goal number one, right? Yeah. Uh, I had no <laughs> illusions of grandeur. So off I set, and I mean, I, I told myself I was going to wait for the gaggle, but I was one of the first to launch. It was actually funny, my first day, First competition day, uh, first action of the race and, and me personally, I was leading out. I was the first one taking a toe. So I was a bit nerve wracked, but took the launch. All, all of us went up uh, and I was uh, hanging out in the gaggle. It felt like 40 minutes before they got all the gliders launched and then they opened the start gate. Oh, wow. So I was already itching to go and it was yeah. blue and I feel like it was almost two o'clock. Mm. So I was like, man, I really felt under the gun. And instead of sticking with allowing the gaggle to lead out and follow them, I just went for it. I go out on this first day of the task and I immediately, you know, I'm, I'm top of start altitude. I think it was 4,000 feet for the day or something like that at that time. And I just bomb it right down into like a thousand foot. I'm like already at a field. <laughs> like I thought, oh, great, great job, Pete. First competition day. And you just basically did a straight line into a field. So I'm over this oh, chicken yeah. farm. And I remember a guy actually saying, hey man, you know, the chicken farms uh, are, are pretty reliable. 
I was like, oh, well, you know, usually those are good thermal triggers. Thanks for the heads up. But I didn't realize, and he was right. I mean, there, I saw one, went over it, bam, got one, slowly worked my way out of there and uh, kind of learned my lesson and then even tiptoed more through the rest of the day, but made it home, which was exciting. Landed, didn't even like, uh, you know, the, the score counted, which I thought maybe I'd screw that up, but turned in my GPS log, IGC, IGC file, right? Um, and actually ended up getting fifth for the day. Nice. I think because some people had pushed pretty hard and landed out, but nonetheless, I'll take it. So that was great. And then we had some more windy days. Uh, but the second race day was much the same. Blue, challenging. I actually got to see the Concordia out on the course, which is really cool, as they all kind of caught up with the sports class. That was really fun to sort of share a thermal, although the Concordia just didn't seem to ever turn. So another really cool experience. Um yeah, and then wrapped it up, came home. I was disappointed we didn't get to fly more days because I know that they have really good weather typically. Sometimes they'll fly almost the entire week, but still it was a great first experience. And I really do, again, recommend anybody, you know, if you've got your silver badge and uh, some experience flying cross country, a doing a competition is just, again, it's just another way to get add to your skills. People are so friendly and welcoming. Don't be intimidated by it, you know, uh, would be something I'd, I'd take away from, from doing that competition. Yeah, definitely. A lot of people I talked to that reached out and did the competition, they had so much fun and they yeah, definitely learned a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I hope that, uh, you know, I got, once COVID stops, we, we get some opportunities. I should say stops. When, when we figure out what to do, uh, I hope that next summer we have some opportunities because it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to getting back in the sky with some people. Definitely. Now, speaking of uh, competitions, now if we go to the uh, VR, or I should say Condor, not everybody's flying VR and Condor, but... You flew some Condor, so can you tell me a little bit about that and what you learned from it? Yeah, I think early on in my flying, I was getting really into flying Condor and seeing it again as a tool. At that time, I was just flying off a normal, like I said, a laptop computer screen, but somehow I figured out, and there's always a new way to do it, but uh, to have a, your PDA get hooked up. So that was, I thought, a really important thing of getting um, familiar with how your PDA operates how to kind of extract information out of it efficiently and, and what you really should be paying attention to. Um, because of course, you know, at first I, you know, what do I know about, you know, PDAs and all that? I was just kind of getting my feet wet. So it was great to, again, be working on that primary flight training, but also then to be in Condor in a really safe environment, working on some of these more uh, advanced flight concepts. So I was just really drawn to that. And, and the U S nightly soaring was, I think the main spark that kind of kept me coming back because you got to fly with other people. And especially pilots like Daniel, too many to mention, who were on there and just fantastic. And it was really competitive with those guys. But my first number of years flying Condor, I mean, I was last place every time, if not landing out. As I was sort of figuring out uh, how to how to get fly efficiently. And Condor, although I, I think it does have some obviously some faults, I think it does teach you like a little bit of tempo. I felt like I kind of got the tempo of cross country flight or thermal cross country flight from it. Um, so that it sort of gets a little more automatic, which I, I, I really felt like helped me when I got into the cockpit. It just felt more familiar to be out because it is so hard to step and kind of break the strings from your home airport. Um, I think Condor can give you some, you know, essentially simulator time that, what do they say, you know, hour in the simulator is worth 10 or 15 minutes of real flight time. I'm not sure, but you start doing that day after day, it, I think it does make a real difference. And like you are saying with VR now, which I finally ponied up and got a VR system. Wow just awesome oh yeah it's great we are we're so lucky golden age right i mean to have it so um i'm disappointed though because i don't think us nightly soaring is operating anymore i think that uh there's a new server for it and i know that some people have, at least in my club and other people i've tried to get turned on to it have difficulty kind of getting into the race and i'll admit that sometimes it does it's a bit technical um i don't know if you've had much experience with it no i i haven't i tried to jump in a couple times and I, I wasn't able to get in. I don't know if I started out too late or what the deal is, but I fly with some other guys and we just kind of have our own races. There's just a few of us that fly together and it's a lot of fun. And I think most of them all now have the VR and you know, it's wild. Wow. That's great. That's yeah. Great. You're all sitting there on the runway getting ready to get launched and you know, you look behind you and we're all lined up. <laughs> have, now, have you heard of, if you're flying the VR, have you heard of the, uh, the force feedback, the Thrustmaster for, Force Feedback 2. I heard about it. I haven't I'm, checked it out. I'm showing my geek card here. So, yeah, you, I don't even make them anymore. You have to get them off eBay. Um, but if, again, you're getting into Contour, if Condor and you're a newer pilot, you might really enjoy it because 
I do think the force feedback in Condor is really good and it's good on the stick. And mainly the main thing is when you work on your patterns, the stick gets real soft if you get slow, just like in the real thing. Right. Um, yeah, that would be amazing. Which I think is invaluable. Um, so it's been pretty durable. I've had mine for years and uh, I've tried to take care of it, but it's still going. Yeah, I'd have to say Condor was just like fundamental to me because I got into soaring really fascinated by cross country soaring. What wanting to kind of understand what that was because I just was in disbelief you could do something like that, you know? So that was always kind of the background and, and to have Condor when I was so hungry to do it um, was fantastic. And then the club and started to sort of develop that cross country focus as well uh, as I was kind of building. So I was lucky enough to be at Merlin pretty early where other pilots, we were just starting to really explore that local area. We were starting to find the first wave flights out of there. Um, we bumped into that. So all that was sort of happening at once. Um, so yeah, Condor was, was definitely fundamental. Now, what are you using in your glider as far as soaring computers? So I've been through many. Uh, I've tried almost all of them, but I keep coming back to a Kobo running top hat. I've really loved that. And I think that actually started with, when I think of the paragliding uh, and the uh, hang gliders, I think that's a, a software program developed by a hang glider pilot. But it's specifically developed to work on e-ink, e-readers. And oh, okay. if you I talk to me at the airport, you know that I'm, I'm like always trying to turn people onto the e-ink, e-reader, especially if you're a flat land soaring pilot. Like um, the black and the white. Sunlight. Yeah, the sunlight visibility is just so nice, especially if you wear sunglasses. Right, um, yeah. It's just, you can, it's so easy to see. And it's not, there's no strain. I was finding that I used to run XC Soar on an Android. Right. Um, it was just killing me. I was having a headache mid-flight from just trying to focus in on that color background screen and uh, I tried an UDI and I felt somewhat similarly. I have recently bought a Nano 4 uh, to have a backup IGC logger and it's also hard to see. So the, I've been hooked on the top hat on a, on Kobo now for many years. And um, it's basically XC Soar top hat, but simplified. You can completely configure. Did you have to add the GPS to it? Yes. And there's a couple ways to do that. But okay. it's pretty simple if you're handy with a soldering iron to install your own. Okay. Um, or you can buy them on eBay pre-configured. Already have the GPS, already have everything on it. Typically, it's going to come okay. with XC Soar, but then you can just install Top Hat if you like that. Right. But again, Top Hat is just a, I, I think, basically running XC Soar. It's just sort of a skin on top of it. Okay. So it's okay. kind of the same thing. So if you're already familiar with XC Soar, you're going to love Top Hat. Nice. But it's just, to me, it's like all the basics you need. So I had that configured, and I've, I've loved that setup. It's easy to read. And the Kobos you can find, again, used, they don't make that style anymore. But I think it will work with a Kobo Glow and a few other e-ink readers. But currently I'm running my, an S100, LXNav S100 is my GPS engine. So I have that out through, uh, an OTC cable, OTG, am I saying that right? Cable, um, that feeds it the GPS information. Oh, okay. So that's worked great for the past. I guess I actually knew this season really. Nice. Because I did recently switch gliders into a 200. So I've been getting all that configured, but, uh, you know, one day maybe dreaming of a clear nav or something, but, uh, right now it's been working great for me. So you flew uh, in Perry. Have you flown anywhere else in the country? Um, yes. I, most, I'll say that I bought a DG100, not a 101, but a 100 out in California. Oh, okay. Um, Avenal, California. So I actually flew out there, bought it, took a text flight, flew, got to fly over the San Andreas Fault, which creates this amazing convergence lift line. I hope I'm saying this right, but I can't remember the mountain range, but... Took a little time, got into it, and had a beautiful flight, landed, put the thing back in the box, and flew home. And then got it shipped from California to Colorado with the Grand Master plan to be have a glider stationed in Colorado and sort of get some experience mountain flying. Okay, Again, nice. Na naive. Um, but went out there and, and kind of started talking with some of the club members there, and the commercial operation there, there was pretty solid. Took some instructional flights in their Grove, got checked out of the Grove, flew uh, with my fiance had a, had a couple of great flights there and then finally said okay it's time i'm getting the 100 so we put that together and i got a taste of trying to thermal soar right there from the flatlands right into the front range um, with the flat iron mountains right there and then of course back into the mountain range are all the ski resorts and this beautiful flying so i could not get into the mountains it was hysterical i'm, I'm flying on that front ridge thinking you know we're just gonna have these booming thermals but it just doesn't work that way it's a little trickier so 
I wish, and I, I think uh, we talked about this before the podcast, Chess in the Air. I really appreciate his, uh, his the information and his, his YouTube channel because he's had some fantastic educational flights about flying out of that area. I just wish I had had that when I was I had a glider station there. So I tried for two years to do some cross country soaring. I took a, a dual flight and a DG five hundred with a club member out there. It's really nice, um, and we we worked along. But I don't think it was a very good day. They have issues with inversions and things like that. So sort of was able to stay up and you know fly around for hours, but never really get out of the vicinity. So finally said, okay, it's time. Let me move this glider back to Richmond and uh, get some flying time on it. So that's about it. Other than, yeah, I guess Perry, California, some time in Boulder for sure. I think that's about it. I'd love to get down to Chilawi, but um, Boulder was great. Maybe just a little too far from Richmond, Virginia to be practical. What's the most fun you've had in a glider flying with others or maybe birds, paragliders, anything like that? I actually have a YouTube channel that I've, I've sporadically put up some flights and there's one where I was I mean, honestly, it was a really cool experience as uh, a cloud forming. You, know, you get to the top of the thermal, it's blue, and seeing a couple of wisps and watching the course of like a minute and 30 seconds, it turning into a ginormous cloud. Oh, nice. Uh, to, you know, I mean, that's the thing about being a glider pilot is that you do get to witness a pretty cool phenomena that most people aren't even aware of, you know, which is this uh, dynamic air mass and the energy that it has. And then also seeing how birds utilize it. I mean, you get to fly with birds that it seems like something out of a National Geographic uh, movie or documentary. I mean, just uh, unbelievable. So uh, we're lucky we actually have a bald eagle that lives off the end of our runway. So I've had a couple of cool flights with those. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Aside from getting I mean, cross country, and I have a gazillion stories about that, uh, that every flight is something special and amazing. But um, the coolest thing about Soren is that even just a local flight, you can kind of still have like your best flight. Like it's uh, it's always something different, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is amazing. Especially a couple of times I've mentioned to people, you know, oh, what'd you do this weekend? I'm like, well, it's in the glider and thermal with a red tailed hawk. They're like, well, wait, what? You were flying with a bird? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, what? <laughs> it just blows their mind. <laughs> right. And it is mind blowing. I, and I remember too, uh, just being so uh, amazed to see, um, that pilots could not only do that, but then of course could fly, five hours or, you know, hundreds of miles. I mean, that that's, it's just magical. So that's why I keep, I guess we all keep coming back. Just on mother nature. Just on mother nature. Pete, did you want to give anyone a shout out? Yes, actually, I wanted to give uh, a shout out to, of course, Eric Lambert, um, because he's been so passionate uh, and has gotten so many pilots into soaring and uh, purchased in the airport and all, all these done for soaring, especially in the Richmond area. I just, I wouldn't be where I am without him, without Dave Riley, who's our club treasurer and the, the kind of guy you got to have at your club that sort of uh, organizes things, gets the tow pilot coming out to the, <laughs> to tow you, uh, sets up some weekday soaring if it can happen. You know, just another, there's so many facets to a club and we're lucky to have some great people in our club. And I, I literally need to name them all to, summarize kind of how I feel about it just because everyone's done their little bit, but certainly Eric Lambert. Thank you. Dave Riley. Thank you. Shout out to Belika, who I think is how I got into soaring long ago. And I know that, uh, he passed away soaring, but, um, that's definitely where I first kind of saw what gliding was about outside of, you know, going around the pattern. Incidentally, I want to shout out to is my brother, Quentin, who actually g gave me my first glider ride back in like, I want to say 2003. I visited him out in California. I think we went to Las Vegas or out into somewhere in California and took a flight in the, sh the three seated Schweitzer. What is that? The, the two, not the 232. It might be the 232. The 232. Anyway, got in that one and he did. I remember he did wing over his surprise. I got sick and I, uh, but I, uh, I thought, Hey, that's cool. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't bite me until years later, which is hysterical, but it was my brother who was so passionate. So if I can give a shout out to anybody, it's him. Uh, and of course, Chris, who's been an awesome club member, I did want to touch up if, if you listen to his podcast, he's an incredible pilot, capable pilot, and another guy that came to the club and pushed our club to the next level, came in and helped him with the social media. I mean, the, when he first came, all we let him do is tow. I mean, he could hardly get a flight in, <laughs> right. guy, so we needed a tow pilot so bad, but he was willing to do it, always shows up. Uh, and then, of course, he's gotten the cap uh, soaring going. He, we've got the cap glider down. I know we talked about that. But I mean, he's been instrumental in that, instrumental in so many things, um, and also just bringing other pilots in from power 
and he's also awesome uh, surfer, wind surfer. Um, so he really brings a lot to the table, and I think that he's he's helped the energy. And it's I, if you're in a club, be that guy. You know, um, we need that in Soren. We all need to. It's a small enough community. We've got to all be pushing and doing our little part. What you're doing here with the podcast to get the kind of next generation going on it and to keep it going and actually make it stronger because it is such a great sport. I feel like so few people know about it. So shout out to you if you're you're doing something at your club to to make it happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete. Had a lot of fun chatting with you today. Yeah, this was great. I really appreciate you having me on and um, I'm looking forward to the other people coming on and hearing their stories too. So, Hi, it's Natalie Fly Girl Kelly. And Fly Alyssa. We are female pilots, aviation lovers, and hosts of the podcast, Cockpits and Cocktails. We use this podcast as a way of sharing our journeys in aviation and allowing other females in aviation to share their amazing, inspiring stories as well. Please give us a listen and join us for this fun, informative podcast with adventure and humor weaved in. Blue skies. Cheers. We now join author and glider pilot Dale Masters for another soaring tale with Dale. This one is called Too Late to Rush, Too Soon to Quit. I was with a very big, heavy student. He was probably overweight, but he claimed he was within the limit. And he was in in the front seat, of course. And we were in a long wing plane, a 20 meter ship with uh, like 46 to one glide. But that doesn't mean it's maneuverable. And uh, that day we were being towed by a guy who was staying uh, at the airport all summer with his newlywed wife they were basically honeymooning on the airport and he got free flying so uh understandably he was almost always too late for work in the morning even though he was supposedly sleeping about 100 feet from the flight line but he was always late and so uh he hurried to get us going for our first flight and we took off before the engine was warm enough and he shook us off or waved us off at the very end of the airport at 100 feet. And as as I've stated previously, ahead of us, we had an orchard followed by a boulder field. So, again, what are you going to do? 100 feet, the book says land straight ahead, but that would have been destroy the airplane and maybe ourselves. So with uh, one or two seconds to think about it, I just dove to the right and basically almost a split S to get us speed and get us turned around and after that diving turn we were in ground effect but not lined up with the airport anymore and it was a long sort of a diagonal approach across trees and buildings to get to the airport and what I did was stay at the top of ground effect which in that plane is probably up around 20 feet 25 feet we, we took the speed we got from diving from 100 feet and carried that minimal ground effect just over the highest hangar and then did a very flat turn and landed on the runway midfield. And by the time the tow plane got back around, the engine was warm. So we went again. That Again, that's the whole story, but it was uh, quite memorable. Thank you, Dale. Looking forward to hearing another soaring tale on our next episode. And now we join Miguel Intermende from the Perlin Project for our tips and techniques segment as he talks about stratospheric wave. To have a stratospheric wave, you have to be in a place where you have uh, winds above the tropopos. And that happens only on our planet in two places, the, the Arctic with the polar vortex and the Antarctica with the polar vortex on the southern hemisphere. You could have a stratospheric wave in over parts of Sweden and even Russia, but it's not as strong, doesn't go as high, and it's complicated because you have to go in winter, and winter conditions in those places will be minus 30, minus 40, lots of precipitation. So the southern hemisphere, not only you have over El Calafate, Argentina, you have 
a stronger polar vortex that produces stratospheric wave that goes higher, but also the the conditions on the ground are not as bad. It's winter when we go there, which is our summer. And, you know, you have days where it snows and so on, but, but a lot of the days are blue days, you know. Uh, blue sky, uh, temperature is maybe five, six degrees uh, uh, Celsius, you know, 40 Fahrenheit or so. And it's quite the, 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 the correct conditions for us to fly. Yeah, so basically the polar vortex it goes around all year long, but when it's stronger, it's in winter, right? Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're on the northern hemisphere uh, polar vortex or the southern. So the months where you have this polar vortex are July, August, and September, which is their, their winter months. And then what we need is wave that is in, this, in the normal atmosphere through the tropopause, align with the polar vortex and that happens in our experience out of those 90 days maybe 10 12 14 15 days the first year i think it happened about three times and we couldn't connect any of the days the second year it happened about three or four times and we were able to connect one time and that time we we were able to uh, capture the the first of the world records and this last year we had about maybe 10 days of wave and we were able to connect about five times now uh, out of those days that all of those that the winds align you know from the surface all the way to a hundred thousand feet or so then you need something else which is good weather you need a bmc uh, you know conditions no precipitation and then winds on the ground that are not excessive there were days where there was wave that align but the surface winds were over 50 knots. We couldn't go. And then there's days where everything works, but you got too many clouds. Uh, so you cannot go either. So out of the 90 days, you might have eight days where all of the winds align. And then out of those eight days, you might only have four where you also have winds to land and take off and clouds that are less than let's say one eighth coverage or something like that we've been developing models to predict this wave you know whether it's aligned and where is it going to be you know and and all of those things and i, I would say the first year we were predicting correctly about 25 percent of the time but the second year we were predicting correctly about 50 percent of the time and now we're predicting correctly about 75 percent of the time as we go farther and farther we are better at predicting uh, the models keep getting better and better. And then so we have better ways to not only predict, but then to align ourselves with the windows, that, those opportunities. Because like I said, it's not just the winds, it's whether there's humidity or not, and whether, you know, are you going to be able to come back and land, or are you going to co come back and have 55 knots of crosswind and not be able to land. Thank you, Miguel. If you want to hear more about the Perlin Project, you can hear our entire chat with Miguel. That's on Episode 8 here on Soaring the Sky. We now join Ben Mays for our Soaring Safety segment to learn how we can become better and safer pilots through aerobatic training. Generally, the introduction to aerobatics is an unusual attitude course or an upside attitude course is generally how people go about it, which kind of includes the spins and most people think of it uh, in, in soaring anyway, is the, what happens when I get flipped upside down in rotor or on the backside of a mountain, or I find myself in a, in a nose low attitude. How, how do I correct for that? Right. That's kind of the biggest fear in, in soaring. Uh, maybe not fear, but you know, that's kind of the big concern in soaring is how do I fix it when it goes wrong? And so that's, that's generally where we start. We do, uh, some loops, some rolls, just to kind of get the idea of let's see the horizon go around, and maybe a little bit of inverted flight. The roll is a little bit more of an advanced maneuver that generally I'm just demonstrating the first time, but the loop is a fairly simple one that gets a, a lot of Gs in the body, so you, you can experience it in, in a controlled kind of slow introduction setting. And then also the, the wing over the chandelle is a, is a really good maneuver um, to just kind of get the energy management of the glider and how do I get the thing slow, get the nose pointed down, and get it fast again. The first few steps, again, it, kinda, it depends a little bit if someone just says, yeah, I really want to learn aerobatics or how do I keep myself safe, um, what we call an upset attitude course here. 
and that would be that would include more of the the spins and just flying inverted getting the glider upright from inverted or from strange attitudes uh, you know a lot of people say you have have to do spin training to be safe and and we push more of this spin recognition where we spend a lot more time on the edge of the envelope not necessarily getting in and out of spins but knowing what that edge feels like so you don't you know so you know how to control it right in that incipient spin phase and and what's going to happen of course we push it over the edge so you see what happens and then recover from that but more of the is just that that understanding of of what happens when we get the glider slow which is a uh, you know it's a it's a big uh conversation piece for a lot of people in the safety world there's there's people on either side of the argument you know you get through private pilot training and and the instructor might encourage spins there depending on operation some some clubs say you have to spin the glider before you fly it but you don't have to be proficient in spins you just have to experience a spin so you experience a spin once early on in your career and you kind of go oh yeah the ground went around and it came back and it was in a Blanick or a 233 or something that doesn't really accelerate very fast. Not a, not a, a, a new high performance ship or a, an AS, uh, you know, a, uh, an ASW 24 or, or some, um, they're designed to speed up and slow down a lot faster than, uh, than the old Blanicks that we spin. Any, any advanced training you can do is always going to be, is, is going to be better, you know, uh, getting getting the opportunity to go out and do any form of spin training, doing any sort of upset attitude training. You're just going to, A, you'll feel more confident as a pilot, uh, you know, leaving these things. Not that you can go do anything that you want to put yourself in any any worse situations, but just, you know, just the ability to control the glider is, uh, is that more uh, advanced. Thank you again, Ben. You can hear more from Ben Mays in our chat with him on episode 40. That one's called Both Ends of the Rope. And, of course, thank you to all of our guest pilots each and every episode for bringing us great soaring content. We hope you get out there and do some soaring this week. Until next time, fly safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you next time right here on Soaring the Sky. If you would like to say hi... Just drop Chuck a line at chuck at soaringthesky.com or you can send us a note on the website soaringthesky.com. Also, if you're a pilot, we want to hear your story. Just send us an email and Chuck will get in touch with you. We hope you join us next week for another great guest and adventure on Soaring the Sky. Music for the podcast was written and produced by Kim Spangler. Voiceover work was provided by Michelle Perez. Graphic design for the podcast was created by Zachary Fulton.